Today is the 24th of July, the day the Black July program began. Agonies of 1983 still reverberate in our minds. I witnessed that violence and was also held in detention, alleging that we were responsible for the program that the state had instigated and sponsored. The regime launched a two-pronged attack targeting the Tamil people as well as the JBP and the left. This resulted in two armed conflicts, the 26 years long armed conflict between the Tamil immigrants and the security forces and their paramilitaries, and the armed conflict between the JVP and the security forces, their paramilitaries and mercenaries. The Black July violence was not the first violent episode in Sri Lanka. Let me dig a little bit into the history. During election campaigns in the 40s and 50s, pro-regime goons used violence against their political opponents. In one of those incidents, Comrade Rohana Vijayvira's father was attacked. He became paralyzed and bedridden until his death. Soon after the single only policy was implemented in 1956, I myself witnessed the violence inflicted upon the Tamil people in the South by some chauvinist Sinhalese groups abetted by the regime and the security force. The Tamil owners of the Singapore traders supplied beetle leaves, BD and cigars to the retail shop my father had maintained. They had to flee the town to escape death. I lost a Tamil schoolmate who was in parallel classes at Rahul College Mathur. It was Mr. Velupille Kuhanendran, whom I later met in 2008 in London. His family had to flee Veligama to evade death. I lost my English teacher, Mr. Rajavarode Rajamathandan, a HSC chemistry teacher at Rahula College Mathur. He had to flee with his family to Jaffna to save their lives. Again in 1963, I lost my GCE advanced level chemistry master, Mr. Vena Aigampille, at Richmond College Gold, just because he was a Tamil. Since the 1970s, both Sinhala and Tamil youth, who came from very similar socioeconomic backgrounds, revolted against the erosion of their socioeconomic, political, and cultural rights. All governments, regardless of their political hue, fail to see the underlying socio-political, economic and psychological causes for these revolts, discrimination and lack of opportunity. The state response of increasing repression pushed the youth to revolt. The fundamental social changes the Sinhala youth expected from the government they helped to elect in 1970 were not forthcoming. So the youth set about organizing to implement the radical changes needed to achieve social justice and that flared into the April 1971 insurrection. Whatever its limitations, the reasons for the conflict point to major flaws in Sri Lanka's democratic institution. During the armed encounter, there were deaths of 41 civilians and 63 security personnel. Between 5,000 and 10,000 JVP cadre and sympathizers had been killed with many being summarily executed. Again, in 1988-89, the security forces killed about 60,000 people, including civilians. During the Tamil militancy, an estimated 70,000 people had been killed by 2007. And when the conflict came to an end in May 2009, the United Nations estimated a total of 80,000 to 100,000 deaths. Whilst held in prison, I had the chance to meet several Tamil political detainees, including Comrade Thambi Pille Santatiyar. He later became a prominent leader of the People's Liberation Organization of Tamil Leela plot. They had been detained for raising black flags in protesting against the 1972 constitution that accelerated the fragmentation of the Lankan society. They were from university campuses and technical colleges. We discussed issues of common interest, such as the April uprising and the issues of the Tamil people. These conversations and my readings on the national question contributed to the development of the JVP policies on the national question that prevailed between 1972 and 1983. I met Sandhya last in 1982 in front of the Wembadi Girls High School, Jaffna, while he was organizing protests against the repression of the state. In 1984, I met another senior leader of PLOT. He wanted me to build and lead an organization parallel to PLOT in the South. However, I was not advocating separation as a solution to the problems of the Tamil people. So I did not support a separatist political campaign. 
though for that discussion i was held in detention for many months under the prevention of terrorism act the 50s were like a dress rehearsal for the tragedy that was replayed in the land of our birth during the latter half of the 20th century and the early part of the 21st century sri lanka has systematically undermined human rights and democratic practice and the rule of law has been drastically undermined by legislation such as the prevention of terrorism act this provided impunity for crimes instigated by the state yet the end of armed violence did not address or resolve the country's socio economic political and cultural problem the demands and the resultant political violence were of a dual character one nationalistic and the other class based one aimed at capturing the state power and the other sought autonomy from the existing state taken in this sense the militancies in both the south and the north have been the products of the failure of economic and political developments in sri lanka the violent tactics of the state marginalized the youth this led to the cycles of political violence and counter violence the violence was the result of the demand for decolonization for reversing the refusal of the ruling elite to share or transfer power and of the rectification of the injustices imposed by colonialism and the post 1948 bourgeois ruling elite in the past successive regimes and their would be successors have used chauvinism and nationalism to divide and rule society as a means of acquiring and maintaining political power a disaster in terms of the number of people who have been killed injured displaced incarcerated and the properties destroyed to get out of this vicious cycle constitutional and regulatory mechanisms need to be developed that ensure just equitable and inclusive treatment of people irrespective of their ethnolinguistic religious and other cultural backgrounds even today democratic and human rights have been subjected to constant erosion repressive legislation provides immunity from responsibility for violation of rights due to the prevailing economic and political crisis further restructuring of the economy deeper cuts to public spending privatization and militarization will be on the cards there will be opposition to such measures repressive measures will be increasingly used to stifle dissent and keep the population traumatized the state will act independently of the parliament outside constitutional and legal norms and with impunity detentions without trial kidnappings and disappearances could become the order of the day patriotism and anti patriotism will become political slogans once more those who value democracy freedom and liberty need to actively oppose this repressive authoritarian political culture such an environment requires the building of a culture that treats the other with dignity respect and fairness for the country to move forward its political elite needs to jettison the conflict paradigm and adopt an interactionist paradigm such a shift could commence with the demilitarization of society and the depoliticization of the public services and the security forces democracy should not mean the right of people to exercise their vote once every 3 to 6 years and for the government then to be left alone to rule the people with violence and authoritarianism the violence is nothing but a reflection of the failure of the sri lankan government to honor its contractual political obligations and agreements with its people the expatriate communities can make a positive contribution by becoming drivers of this paradigm shift by creating a new reality through dialogue and interactions with each other the rich diversity of our cultures should bring us together rather than divide we can be united despite our diversity differences and disagreement i take this opportunity to honor and salute all comrades and friends of all communities of all backgrounds who devoted and sacrificed their lives for the cause of achieving fairness equality and liberty for their community they genuinely believed in the causes they were committed to of eliminating injustice to achieve fairness opportunity and liberty our responsibility and duty will be to remove the barriers to achieving the just objectives they sacrificed their lives for thank you